trouble before victory. What does that mean when we have conflict? But wait a minute, that's before we have victory if we are believers. We're looking at Exodus 4 through 7. We'll look at that today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hibbert. I'm Janice. This is, of course, Bible Discovery TV. Thank you for joining us. Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? I'm going to be talking about ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs that may mention the proper name of God. The proper name of God. That is very interesting. Now, what did you study today? It's another here? fantastic Friday, which means another fantastic question for Ryan, for Corey, for Rod, and for you from Exodus chapter 5. Wait a minute. For me too? Uh -huh. Oh, my goodness. I don't know about that. Anyway, okay, Ryan, what's up? Today it's the ultimate showdown, Pharaoh versus Moses, the so-called gods of Egypt versus the living God. That and more coming up later on in the program. The beginning of the 10 plagues. This is really interesting study. Get your Bible out and your Bible guide because we are going to look at God's Word. Exodus 5, verses 1 through 14. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw, Go get yourself straw where you can find it, yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, Fulfill your work, your daily quota, as when there was straw. Also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as before? Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Thank you, Janice. What a great, great passage of Scripture. You know, often we may feel like if we just could get with God's will, everything would be okay. But you know, when Moses and Aaron moved according to God's instruction and his will, they were not okay. In fact, Pharaoh made it worse for the people of Israel. Now, what do we mean by okay? See, we should understand that the will of God is not a matter of comfort, but of obedience. We gain purpose and ability when we choose to move in the way that God desires us to move. Israel discovered that in Exodus, this is what happened. Pharaoh was being confronted with the reality that Israel was a people belonging to God, not to him. And it's important because Egypt was a powerful nation. Egypt had received them and helped them in a time of need and not for the purpose of becoming slaves to this ancient land, which Pharaoh was making them and had made them. Their trouble increases as Pharaoh is confronted with God's will. Now, this was the beginning of the 10 plagues of Egypt during which God would strike them according to the gods of their worship. In other words, what I'm saying here is that there was a gods 
of their worship or demonic forces, but God was the real God. And so there became a war, spiritual war. And that war has continued even to this day. Jesus Christ came, died on the cross and rose again. And as he rose again, that war or that striving became victory as Jesus Christ passed on the cross and said, it is finished. What an amazing thing. And as we look at this, we need to consider what God is doing here. Uh, just so you know, get your Bible guide if you have it and turn to today's passage. This is the new Bible guide and I'm very excited about it. I really am. Uh, it is a excellent book and I want to encourage you that if you don't have yours, why not? We'll send it to you. If you write to us, you can use the address at the bottom of the screen or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com. And some people have described me as a, a kid in the candy store, you know, when talking about this, because I love it. <laughs> it is the first time we've designed a Bible guide like this, and it is really good. All new material. You can also call. The phone numbers are there to call and get it quickly. And I encourage you to get to it and uh, get it. Anyway, it's important for us to turn to the page today as we begin to study and understand chapter five here in this particular book. Then Moses, the last part of chapter five, then Moses turned to the Lord and said, oh Lord, why have you done this evil to the people? Moses explains after all the difficulty, he explains, Lord, why have you done this evil to the people? Well, God doesn't design us to go through evil, but God designs us to follow him. Evil will resist us. But evil was not the purpose of Israel, and they will soon find that out. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, as we look at the trouble before the war, as we look at the interesting ways in which you navigate through, help us to understand today what you're telling us and what you're speaking to us so that we can be ready to operate in the future and be ready to know the truth about who you are and what you do in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. As we look at the scripture, I'd encourage you to consider Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says clearly, afterward, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and told him, said, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, let them go that I may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord, our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with the sword. Interesting. The first point is important as we begin to realize something here. Moses and Aaron knew their God and told Pharaoh about them, but they didn't know him really. And we must know God and how we should live. Now they said, well, unless God comes down on us, you know, and strikes us with swords. God would not do that if he was talking to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and Pharaoh didn't let him go. God will not punish his people. That's what we see with the 10 plagues of Egypt. That's exactly what we gather. So we need to understand that, that the Lord does things so that we can know him better. Now, they're going to know him, beloved. They're going to find out exactly who God is because God does that through the rest of the 10 plagues. And God speaks to the people and he says, all of these various gods, the gods who you call the frog gods, the gods who you say control the locusts, the gods who you say control the rain and the hail, all of those gods, I'm going to deal with all of them. And as he does, God shows us who he is. He's the supreme God. Exodus 5, 4 to 9 say, then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Why? Get back to your labor. Then the king or the Pharaoh said to them, look, the people of the land are many now and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks before. Let them go and gather the straw for themselves. 
and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks, which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it, and let them not have regard for false words. Well, <clears throat> I tell you, Pharaoh told Moses and Aaron the Israelites would work more because the Israelites put their God as more important than Pharaoh. He made hard labor their punishment. Spiritual war has consequences. I remember talking to somebody who said to me, I don't want to get into the spiritual war. It has consequences. Of course it has consequences. But the spiritual war you have victory over. That's what Jesus Christ has given you. Victory. Do you know what that means? Victory means you go into a fight knowing that you're going to come out of that fight victorious. You know, you don't go into a fight and not fight it. Victory is a result of fighting a war and winning. Very important. Exodus 5.10 says, And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says the Pharaoh, I, I will not give you straw. Go get yourself straw where you can find it, yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, Fulfill your work, your daily quota as when there, are, there was straw. Also officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as before? Now here we have this point. The Israelites were beaten and tortured for obeying God, persecuted church. They were beaten and tortured. There are times when we will seem to suffer for obeying God. That's a fact. But if we are faithful, God is always faithful. God will always bring victory. Very important. We are in this not as a pleasure cruise, but this is a battleship, beloved. When we come on earth and we invite Jesus Christ into our heart to be Lord of our life, we're joining a battle. And may I encourage you today that the battle, we are victorious through the power of Jesus Christ. We have to do the battle that the Lord has called us to. are going to be focusing in on some interesting evidence uh, for the Israelites from the nation of Egypt. So we're going a little bit beyond the time period of the Exodus here, but a lot of people think there's absolutely no evidence for Israel existing in the time period of the judges or even existing uh, in Egypt ever, but there's actually quite a bit of evidence. Today, we're going to focus in on just one piece. We're going to be focusing in on the time period of the judges. Take a look. The early history of the Bible, just like the early history of mankind, is challenging to verify or establish through archaeological methods. This difficulty is due to the many thousands of years that separate us from these events, allowing for decay, natural and forced. The places and lifestyles that the Bible depicts for early Israel also present a challenge. Israel living in the Egyptian Nile Delta, for example. No papyrus documentation has survived from any time in Egypt's early history from this marshy area, and much of its architecture was removed and reused in subsequent centuries. In place of direct evidence, then, archaeologists and historians will look for circumstantial evidence when it comes to time periods, especially before the time of King Solomon after whose life the biblical histories can be largely verified through archaeological findings and mentions in the records of neighboring kings. Every once in a while, though, an astounding find provides solid evidence that the Bible's history should be taken seriously. 
In modern day Sudan, three ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic inscriptions were deciphered that contain the proper name of God as recorded in the Bible. The oldest of these inscriptions was dated to 1400 BC. Biblically speaking, this would be about 50 years after the Exodus, and so about 10 years into the conquest of the Promised Land during Joshua's leadership. The inscriptions are a part of a listing of people groups living in and around Canaan, the Promised Land, and God's name is used in them to designate a people group, the Shasu of Yahweh. Shasu was a term used to describe people who lived semi-nomadically. Unique to these Shasu of Yahweh is that all the other listed people groups are given a land designation, while these people were defined by the name of their God. Carved on ancient walls in Egyptian script, history portrays a group of people living in Canaan semi-nomadically 50 years after the Exodus, right when the Bible places tent-dwelling Israel beginning her takeover of that very place. So this is just one example of evidence for the ancient Israelites existing this early on in, in their history, uh, in the region, you know, them taking over the land of Canaan. Now there is other evidence for this. It's not as much as we would like, but time is ticking on and more research is happening and more finds are occurring. Uh, and it's been exponential growth of evidence. It's just been, um, finds, explaining other finds, and and really opening up the door here to this ancient history. So I just expect that there is going to be more. If you'd like to do a little bit of research on your own, I would really suggest looking up the Associates for Biblical Research. Uh, they have a YouTube channel as well, and they've done some really great work here focusing in on uh, a, uh, ancient evidence for the Israelites, specifically from Egypt. So I'd encourage you to look them up. Uh, right now, we're going to find out what Ryan has studied today. Ryan? Thanks, Corey. Today, I'm actually doing a really fascinating study on the showdown between the Pharaoh of Egypt and Moses, in which God brought 10 plagues on the Egyptians. Now, interestingly, Egypt's magicians were able to somehow mimic some of these plagues. Now, what I wanted to know was if these were demonically powered feats or if they were merely illusions and tricks. To help me with this study, I turned to professional illusionist Andre Cole, who was actually creative consultant to David Copperfield. As a young man, Cole, as a professional illusionist, set out to disprove the miracles of Jesus Christ, but simply could not, and he ended up giving his life to Christ. I ask you to simply consider his incredibly unique perspective in regards to this particular biblical account. Exodus chapters 7 through 12 document the dramatic showdown between Pharaoh and Moses, between Egypt's false gods and the living God Almighty, who demanded that they let my people go. What followed was a series of 10 plagues, some of which the Egyptians seemed to be able to duplicate. Though some concede that the acts performed by the Egyptian practitioners were supernatural satanic acts, others believe that they were nothing more than illusions and tricks. For example, famous delusionist Andre Cole, who also served as David Copperfield's creative consultant, says that most individuals are not aware of what those trained in the art of illusion can accomplish. I have no doubt that the illusions performed by 20th century magicians would baffle ancient practitioners. Changing a stick to a snake is child's play when one considers that modern day magicians cause elephants to vanish and appear. The problem, he says, is that if Satan and demons can perform miracles, the argument of miracles as an apologetic for the deity of Christ must be considered worthless. Jesus himself said, if I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. Regarding the extent of Satan's power, the apostle Paul wrote, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Notice that none of these great signs and wonders are real. All of them are deception only, or as Paul qualifies, lie signs and lie wonders. This is the extent of Satan's power. Interestingly, the Bible uses the expression secret arts to describe the acts of the Egyptian practitioners, which, says F.C. Cook, is ambiguous. It may come from a word meaning flame, or from another meaning conceal. In either case, it implies a deceptive appearance, an illusion, a juggler's trick, not an actual putting forth of magical power. 
Also, says Cole, the response of the Egyptian magicians after the plague of gnats, that this is the finger of God, lends weight to the argument that their previous works were only tricks, and that they knew the difficulty in performing a trick with such a small entity, a trick which they were incapable of. If Satan could turn a stick into a snake and bring up frogs, he certainly should have been able to produce the less complex life form. To teach that Satan was able to take a dead stick and change it into a living serpent, or that the magicians could change water into life-giving blood, is to teach that Satan has the ability to create life. However, as a being created by God, Satan has neither power to create anything out of nothing, nor life out of anything. The Bible clearly teaches that God alone is the creator. Now, interestingly, like Andre Cole, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus also believed that the Egyptian magicians were performing illusions. Josephus claims that after Moses had performed the sign of the staff becoming a serpent, Pharaoh was very angry with him and called him an ill man who had formerly run away from his Egyptian slavery and came back with deceitful tricks and wonders and magical arts to astonish him. And when he had said this, he commanded his priests to let him see the same wonderful sights as knowing that the Egyptians were skillful in this kind of learning, and that he was not the only person who knew them and present them to be divine. As also he told him that when he brought such wonderful sights before him, he would only be believed by the unlearned. Now, when the priests threw down their rods, they became serpents. But Moses was not daunted at it and said, O king, I do not myself despise wisdom of the Egyptians, but I say that what I do is so much superior to what these do by magic arts and tricks, as divine power exceeds the power of man. But I will demonstrate that what I do is not done by craft or counterfeiting what is not really true, but that they appear by the power and the providence of God. Very interesting report from Josephus and something to consider. Mm. And Josephus, of course, is not a biblical scholar or a biblical writer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was somebody in the area. He's just a historian, who, yeah. He's first, a Roman yeah, historian. First century, yeah. yeah. And he, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was an interesting guy, but uh, the important part of this, I think, is that there came a time when the uh, the magicians could not repeat what was being done. Yeah. And, it's, and what did they say? Well, they, it, said, they said, this is the finger of God. Yeah, mm -hmm. This is the work of God. <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost yeah. like they looked at her and said, no, this is the real deal. <laughs> yeah, like, I can't replicate we, this we one. We can't replicate this one. Yeah. So the magicians <laughs> at that point were convinced. Mm -hmm. uh, that, oh, that I, this is nobody yeah. to mess with. Well, God yeah. is God, and that's what's happening. Well, yeah, and of course, you know, these the people, Pharaoh's servants were begging him, you know, stop, let's, please stop this, yeah. you know, so, just let them go. Because yes. there was real suffering that was going exactly. on. Exactly. You know, yeah. Pharaoh was, was, you know, he, they were, Pharaoh was strong, and he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, mm -hmm. I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. So he thinks he's God. He thinks he's, there's a lot going on here. But that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really, really is. Yeah, and you know, it makes me think of uh, the the issue of fake mummies. Uh, have you guys heard of this issue of fake mummies? Mm -hmm. Real ancient mummies, but ancient fake mummies. So um, there have been thousands of animal mummies that have been found. And um, as an ancient Egyptian, you could purchase mummies um, from priests or pay a priest to sacrifice, for example, a cat or a bird or something of that nature to offer as a sacrifice in a temple. Well. Archaeologists have found thousands of these animal mummies, and some of them are real. They unwrap them, and there'll be a full-blown mummified cat in there. But others, they've x-rayed and open, and it'll just be a bone or <laughs> nothing. Or and But yet it's wrapped up to look exactly like the form of a cat hmm. in, in a coffin. And so it just seems like you know it was a really expensive process. It took a really long time. So they could kill one cat, mummify one cat, Slice and, it all up and, and make fifty money. Get from like a mass cat. production of fifty cats. So, and, so yeah. you know, this wouldn't be completely out of character for an ancient Egyptian priest. So, is what I'm saying. There's some. There's some context there. So this there. is a, the, here, I mean, this is the situation where you have people who are believing in this in the things mm -hmm. and. And the, God says in the Ten Commandments, which come later, after they're out yeah. of Egypt, he says, don't put your faith in things, mm. in idols that have mouths but cannot speak, ears cannot hear, eyes cannot see. Mm -hmm. Don't put your faith in things, yeah. but put your faith in me live. And so Jesus comes fully human. Jesus, of course, is part of God. He comes fully human and we kill him. And then we, he raises from the dead and miraculously by the work of God. And so this is an amazing thing that we understand. God put all of that to rest with Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. 
That is really interesting. So mm. God says to us, don't put your faith in things, but put your faith in me. I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, that was really good. Good, Ryan. Good report. <laughs> now, we have this question that comes to us, and uh, yes. I don't know if this is a fabulous or a fun or a whatever you want it's to call it. It's a fantastic one. Fantastic. That's what it is. <laughs> it's fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> and it comes to us from Exodus chapter 5. Chapter 5. How many days journey into the desert to sacrifice to the Lord did Moses and Aaron ask of Pharaoh? Three days five days or seven days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think we got it. We got it. Yep. We got this. Three days. They asked for a three day. Because, you know, journey. every one of those numbers, it's a good number. Three, mm -hmm. five, seven. Yeah. God's number. Five it's fingers. A good number. Seven is God's number. Yeah. I know. But three. They are they really good numbers. I, I think three is our final answer. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, they started small. They started small. <laughs> yeah. Three days. There's, 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 there's some good reasoning going on here. It's pretty solid. And I think I've given you enough time at home to look through Exodus 5 to find your answer if you didn't know it already off the top of your head. And the answer, of course, is three days. And if you check Exodus chapter 5, verse 3, you will find that, that now they it, asked for three days. And, 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 interesting. and the answer was no, by the way. The, we, Pharaoh said no. Oh, he said no. You're not going. That's right. That's not a good, that's not very good. Yeah. Pharaoh, not uh, having Pharaoh, any that's days. not a good, that's no not days. a good answer. And uh, bottom, uh, bottom of the Red Sea, we'll tell you that. But we can, we, we can mm. talk about we'll that, talk about that in later. the future, mm -hmm. a couple of days in the future. Anyway, uh, it took them also 40 years to get to the Promised Land, which was 12 to 14 days away. Yeah. Yeah. So why did it take them so long? Why does it take me so long to learn things? <laughs> right? I go yeah. around yeah. and around and around sometimes. <laughs> That's human nature, Janice. I mean, we all have it. We have to pray, oh, God, deliver me from mm -hmm. human nature. Every and, day. And the Lord does, you know. I mean, he, he helps you. He's good. He's Hopefully. faithful. I mean, as he we does. get older, we're getting older, you know. I do. I know that. And as we get older, we're, we're getting, I think, okay. less of human nature, hopefully. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, stay with us. We're going to be having a good time as we study over the next few days. The other five books of Moses are still to come. <laughs> 